Okay, this lecture is on chapter 52, which is how organisms regulate their osmolarity. So we use excretory systems in order to control the amount of our fluids, the concentration what's dissolved in our fluids, um, and the composition of the fluid that's surrounding our cells. Um, and then it's also used to get rid of waste material, which we'll see at the very end of the lecture. Um, animal physiologists use the term osmolarity when they're talking about osmosis. So we'll be using this term osmolarity when we're talking about the fluids of um, organisms. And remember that animals like to be in an isotonic environment. So they want to have their extracellular fluid the same um, osmolarity as their intracellular fluid. Um, because remember, if there's a concentration gradient, water is going to move from one place to another. And animal, for the most part, we don't want that to be happening. So the um, organisms use excretory organis uh, organs in order to regulate this osmolarity and the volume of their extracellular fluids. And they do this by excreting certain solutes that are in excess. And so we have sodium chloride, for example. We get rid of it through this process. We also use it to conserve certain solutes that are valuable or in short supply, for instance, glucose. And the output of this whole process is urine. So urine is, for a closed circulatory organism, blood waste. Um, but it's the waste product that's produced through this excretory system. And um, the chapter goes on, and you don't have to um, know the different organisms and their different excretory systems anymore. However, all excretory systems have three kind of processes in common. Um, first is filtration, and generally this is done with positive pressure. So the um, fluid is under positive pressure, which forces material through a membrane. Um, it's going to leave behind large things such as cells and proteins, um, but the smaller molecules um, and ions and stuff will get pushed through, as well as water. Um, then there's a process of secretion where um, that filtrate can then be modified. Additional things can be added to it that are not needed. And then reabsorption occurs where materials that are needed, um, for instance, water, um, can be reabsorbed, and that's going to concentrate the urine. And the concentration of urine, especially with a terrestrial organism, is important because you don't want to be losing a lot of um, water through this process. So different animals live in different environments, and so they have to deal with these things in different ways. So if you're a terrestrial animal, such as us, we need to conserve salts and water. Um, that's why, like, if you're exercising a lot, you'll drink, like, Gatorade. That's to help replenish some of those salts that are lost through sweating um, and the water. Freshwater animals have an opposite problem. They need to conserve these salts, but they have an excess of water. So here is a unicellular protist. And this organism lives in a freshwater environment. So inside of the cell is more concentrated than the outside of the cell. So the water will constantly be moving into the cell. So this organism does not have a cell wall, and so it needs to get rid of this water. And so it has a, um, vac a contractile vacuole, and it acts like a bilge pump, which is constantly pumping water out of the cell so that the cell does not burst. If we look at marine mammals, marine animals, marine animals have, are living in a very high osmolarity. Um, and so they have to somehow adjust to this. Now, some are osmoconformers. And we talked about thermoconformers and thermoregulators earlier. It's the same idea. But this is, are they expending energy to maintain a constant osmolarity? Or are they, um, their osmolarity going to change with their environment? So osmoconformers will have the same osmolarity as their environment. Osmoregulators will regulate their osmolarity. And some organisms, just like we saw with um, thermoconformers, are not just necessarily one side or the other. Um, there are organisms that can be osmoconformers in one environment and osmoregulators in another environment. So an example of that is this organism. Um, and this organism, when it's in the seawater, its osmolarity is going to be the same as its environment. So as the osmolarity of the seawater increases here, the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid also increases. So here it's just an osmoconformer. But it can't survive much below this osmolarity or much above this osmolarity. So at very low osmolarity, it will actually be an osmoregulator, and it will maintain a certain osmolarity. And at very high concentrations, it will also osmoregulate. So it does both, depending on the conditions that it lives in. 
Another example of an organism that has to um, adapt to the way that it, it to its environment is um, birds that survive on eating marine animals. So the marine animals are going to have a higher concentration of salt in their tissues. So organisms such as this bird, um, what they do, we go back, what they do is they have these, um, they have salt glands. And these salt glands help to concentrate the salt and it goes into their nasal cavity and they excrete it and you can see a little ball of salt water here. And what you'll see these birds doing is like shaking their head. And what they're actually doing is shaking off this um, highly concentrated salt um, from their these salt glands. Okay, um, the last thing I want to talk about with, um, with respect to the urinary system is the um, different waste products of metabolism. So we also use the excretory system to get rid of some waste products. So if we're breaking down carbohydrates and fats, those are mostly carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And so the byproducts of that are going to be carbon dioxide and water. That's not very difficult to get rid of. We exhale this, and um, that can be part of the urine. We're using that part of our body anyways. Um, however, when we're breaking down pro proteins and nucleic acids, we are producing nitrogen. And the nitrogen is a little more of a problem to get rid of. So we have these missed nitrogen, and we need to get rid of it. Um, it ends up being toxic to our body. So most organisms actually convert it into ammonia. Ammonia is highly toxic, but it's very soluble, so they just secrete it into their environment. If they're in, a, in, a, um, in a, uh, an aquatic environment, a marine environment, and as long as they're not uh, like a fish kept in a very small fish tank and the water not clean, they don't have a problem. Dilution is the solution, right? Um, now, marine uh, ma uh, land mammals have a little more of a problem. Land animals have a little more of a problem. So we can't afford to lose that much water and this dilute ammonia. So we expend a little more energy. This is a little more um, energy um, intensive to make urea. But we produce urea where we can produce a little more concentrated. It's not as toxic. We do need to get rid of it. Um, but we don't lose as much water that way. Now, organisms that live in very arid environments or do not have access to fresh water as much may expend even more energy and form a molecule called uric acid. Um, and we see this, it's kind of like a, like a paste you see, you know, like on your car or something from a bird. Now, organisms, again, are not necessarily going to be only produce urea or only produce uric acid. Um, most organisms are producing all of these, but maybe primarily one. So, for instance, us, we produce more primarily urea. However, we do make some ammonia, and we do produce uric acid as well. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the disease called gout. Um, it's a form of arthritis, but that's a uric acid crystals um, accumulating in the joint. So just to, so you know, there were kind of organisms can do a little bit of each of these. Um, and then the last thing I just want to touch on, um, you do not need to know the, the kidney and the function of the kidney anymore. However, it is an example of that countercurrent exchange that we've talked about before. So I just wanted to point that out to you, that um, in the kidney there's what's called the loop of Henle. So these tubules are flowing in opposite directions. So the fluid is going down this side and going up this side. And we end up with that countercurrent uh, multiplier. And that helps to concentrate our urine. So it's just another example of that countercurrent exchange. So I hope this helps. All right.